This is Pick Up The Mic Podcast on WWMVLP 95.5 and Radio 22. This is Pick Up The Mic Podcast. I'll be your host, Corey Whitmore. This podcast aims to bring new voices into the conversation about how to eliminate racial disparities in education in the Madison Metropolitan School District. Over the past couple of months, we've had numerous interviews with African-American high school juniors and seniors, principals, teachers, uh, mental health therapists, to give us more perspective on how we start this conversation and, and how we find potential solutions. Here in episode four, uh, we're going to continue with talking about the black experience, but we're going to focus kind of on the impact um, students uh, going to school and growing up in this this um, Trump era, George Floyd era, BLM era. We really want to talk about what impact that has had on their school experience. I think it's very important that we we take you know this episode and last episode. To, to really try to figure out what in that learning experience may, may be having a negative effect um, on the students that may be reflected in some of the, the testing, some of the scores, uh, may be reflected in the, the high suspension and, and expulsion rates. Um, I do think it's all connected. And for us to be able to figure out, you know, what are the best practices? What are the things that need to be done? What are the things that need to be addressed? I do feel that we really need to dive into what I've labeled it as, quote unquote, the black experience um, for these students and figure out from there what things need to be done to create the best environment for them to be able to learn and excel. So we're going to start off this episode with interviews from the uh, from our students from our Madison Metropolitan School District students talking about their environment. So the question I posed to them was, um, has anything that's happened outside of school like things with uh, Donald Trump or things uh, with BLM or things with George Floyd, have those things found their way into school, into your school? And has it kind of changed um, anything about your your environment in which you are trying to learn and achieve in. So here's what those students had to say. When we start to talk about like religion and things of that sort, the first thing the teacher always says is, um, I can't tell you my opinion or I can't put my opinion onto you, but I can tell you about both sides and let you like decide for yourself. But I can't like pers- persuade you to one side or to right. think a different way or be biased basically. Okay. And so, like, like when we come to, like, issues, like, social justice issues, mm-hmm. I can tell the teachers have, like, a really hard, like, they struggle talking about it because they feel mm-hmm. so passionate about it. And they really, like, most of the teachers, like, they like, like, they really legit are, like, oh, like, they try to say, like, their opinion, but, like, not to try to make it biased. Okay. But most of the time, it's really on the side of, like, oh, like, Dang, like this girl got like the police shot this girl or they shot this mm. unarmed black man. Is- um when when Trump's era first started, um, I can remember like there'd be students asking teachers like, Who are you gonna vote for? And it would it was kind of weird because the you have a lot of teachers that have just pushed the question off or quickly, um, I'm not allowed to answer that and it would kind of um give like mixed vibes towards some teachers it was more of like a whoa, like the way the way that they said it, the way that we perceived it was, oh, maybe she supports Trump or maybe he supports Trump. And it was more so of like the way that they looked at you. You could tell that them telling you no, the way like that they couldn't answer the way that they were telling you were more so of like, I can't tell you because I might not have my job and my students might not look at me the same. So mm. it was it was a lot of tension around the school because um In places, especially with um, different races of teachers, um, there were tension between the teachers because no one knew who anybody else was voting for or if anyone had um, 
believed and felt the same as Trump did. So it was it was more of like a like a weird a weird vibe. I've never been into politics even in school. Right. But um being black I feel that there are things that you do have to stay in the loop, like certain stuff um with politics that you have to stay in tune with. And yeah, it's just it was just the way that that people started acting. Like a teacher wouldn't act the same that she did before we started talking about politics or before the election was about to come up. Um the teacher was mm. really open to everyone and then after election she focused on a certain group of students more than the rest of the class. Um, I mean, obviously, like, I think things would be a lot different if we were in school. But mm -hmm. uh, when I'm in class, like, if, like, something just happened, like, I remember when the January 6th thing happened at the Capitol, my teacher was asking, like, oh, how do people feel about it in class? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, like, me, like, everything that's happened in this past year, like, nothing really surprises me anymore. Like, I guess mm -hmm. I'm there. And I think, like, just seeing, like, the reactions of, like, white students, they're just so shocked and, like, this, that, and the other, it, like, really shows, like, like, we, like, it's really different out here for, like, black and, like, white students. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, so I definitely think it's affected, like, school and, like, like, everything just seems to be so political now. And, like, I feel like we're always just having discussions about it. And, like, sometimes it, it gets tiring talking about it, like, right. especially, like, black student who's always pulled into conversations like that but yeah it's definitely had an effect um with all the all the stuff going on it has um like a lot of stuff is being unearthed about <clears throat> some uh like students at our school or something like they have said some past racist like they posted something that would be racist in the past or something and it's being mm. brought up just now and it's like why is this why is this just now being like given attention? Like, mm -hmm. wh why wasn't this like something that would be posted like five years ago and just now that they're getting like punished or punished for it? And with all the, with all the like the, um, like black people being shot and stuff, it's like you get kind of numb to it at some point. Like, mm -hmm. like you see it on the news and it's just like, there goes another one, you know, and it's like, like, um, it's not even, it's not even surprising anymore. And that's that, that's, that's the scary part of it because if people are dying, then you should be surprised if you see it on the news, but it's not. Hmm. And, and that may be a, a side effect for your generation that, that, that numbness because you're, you're inundated with it every day every single day um it's 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 going to be interesting to see how that how that trauma plays out as you guys um grow up and that's a million dollar question and we'll have to wait and see how does that trauma what impact will that trauma have what are the long-term effects of of uh, seeing things like uh what happened to george floyd and and Breonna Taylor and others, how that is going to play out in the mental health of these students as they grow up. But we're going to go ahead and take a short break. Pick up the mic podcast. We'll be back right after this. You are tuned in to Pick Up The Mic Podcast with your host, Corey Whitmore. Before we jump into a second set of interviews from our students, I wanted to point something out uh, that I found in an online publication called The Imprint, Youth and Family News. Um, it's an article uh, written by Nadra Nidal um, titled, Black Male Teachers, A Rare and More Precious Resource in the wake of George Floyd killing. Um, in this article, um, they talk a lot about uh, black mental health. There was uh, a part to this um, in supporting mental health for black students that stuck out to me. It was um, an African-American uh, parent that was at a school board meeting that was talking about the need for um, uh, to, to be able to identify emotional baggage in children and 
and also noted the impact on black uh, parents and teachers. Um, so this article says that Jerlene Tatum, an African-American parent of four children attending Long Beach School, said that at a recent Long Beach School board meeting, she discussed how important it was for the district to invest in emotional support for students, even as proposed state budget cuts threatened to make it harder for districts to prioritize such funding. Uh, quote, we need to create spaces for dialogue and train teachers to identify the emotional baggage children bring into the classroom. She goes on to say, any child who saw the murder of George Floyd is going to need help. She also noted that black parents and teachers are experiencing trauma themselves after Floyd's death, all while having to report to work, take care of children, and manage their own reactions to racial justice. There's a lot. There. <laughs> there's a lot there. I wish I could have been at that uh, that school board meeting because there's a lot pointed out there. You know, looking for the school to create those spaces for for dialogue, looking to train teachers to be able to identify emotional baggage. I am not a teacher, so I'm not sure if 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 that is part of their training. I'm not sure if if that's asking too much to be able to, to train uh, teachers to be able to identify those things. So, so that's a that's a, a great question and maybe something that uh, I may need to do a uh, follow up with uh, Mr. Shackelford and and maybe some others to, to see if they can answer that question. But I also noted that and something I think that gets overlooked, black parents and teachers are experiencing the trauma themselves, uh, but yet are trying to hold things together. And what spaces do they have? to work through that trauma. So that is interesting to not only create that space for students, but what about those teachers? What about those parents in the community? Where does space get made for them? So that's something important to think about. All right, we are gonna dive back into uh, interviews from our students. Um, those are also gonna be followed up uh, by two uh, excerpts of interviews from two of our community leaders as well. But let's go ahead and hear from the students. Yeah, um, I like how the word that you use, division, I definitely feel like that's what he created. Now it's just like the racists are not even afraid anymore. They're just coming out. Um, for example, like this um, last, last summer, um, with like the rise of BLM and like um, the whole thing with George Floyd, um, a lot of student outs uh, and uh, sorry, um, mentioned about it, like everyone who said the N word, like if you're white and your friend had a video of you saying it, they just posted it. And all of a sudden everyone is like, oh, I'm the good one. I'm the good white person. But my friend, on the other hand, they said the N word. But then I'm like, you're doing this just so you can be on the clear. Like, we know you probably said it too. It's just, we don't have proof. We don't have the receipts. But if you're associating yourself with these people, you probably said it. Like, I'm not, like, um, I actually had a personal um, um, situation with, like, this whole thing. Like, there's some friends that, like, I lost because of these things. They were like, oh, I'm not racist. Well, nobody's going to come and be like, oh, you know what I'm actually racist like nobody's gonna be like I'm racist but the things that they did during the, those situation you could just they were just screaming racist it wasn't just like their actions was just racist like if your friend is gonna say the n-word but don't do anything about it and just sit back and observe like what kind of person are you you're not gonna stand up for your black friend like what do you think you're doing like Oh, that whole summer, like this whole summer was just so frustrating. And also like um, the the post that everyone is like posting, like every day, every day that I go on Instagram, I see a black person being hurt. Like, I feel like, like a um said, um, I feel like we're just numb now. Like we, we see and we move on. 
which shouldn't be a thing like i feel like we should grieve like that could be our brother that could be our uncle like they just make it seem like oh it's just a normal day like no like that's one of my people that could be me they just make it seem like it's oh no biggie they normalized it which is which shouldn't be normalized yeah and i think the biggest thing too as you mentioned earlier is with social media um because like you said we're seeing everything in real time and there's this expectation of like you have to post this you have to post this otherwise you're a racist or otherwise you know you support this and if you don't like and then you have all of this performative activism you have your white friends texting you saying are you okay and then when you talk to them and like really talk to them they're like oh yeah it's like they're doing it to to stop their guilt they want to they don't want to be guilty and so i think the biggest thing that's not understood within the education system is the fact that we're sitting here watching this every day it's on the news like it's on cnn it's on the local news it's on the new york times it's on tw- every single yeah as a trip every single place that you go you can't go without seeing um, Dante being killed or watching the George Floyd video. And it's again and again, watching somebody who looks like you or like like George Floyd, like he, he reminds me of my dad, he's around the same age. So it's again, like watching that every single day, that 10 minute tape of him dying. And we're just expected to be like, oh yeah, that sucks. Now go write your essay on like genocide or whatever. And it's just like, oh, yeah, that's like for you to move on. And it's because white people, they don't see that representation. S- like seeing that every single day, it it's just like, it basically is like, that's me. That's me. It makes you scared to go out to do things, you know? And I think the biggest thing that I've noticed is everybody, um, when my, my grandmother, my uncle will call, they always ended with, just so you know, I, I love you. And please be safe. Please be careful out there every single time. Mm. And I just, that's not something that white people think about. When I try to explain it to white people, they're like, well, not all black people are scared of the police. And I'm like, I, if you know a black person who is not scared of the police and who's not scared of the political climate, I am so happy for them, honestly, that they do not have to deal with that anxiety, with that trauma of thinking that could be me, that could be my father, my grand. I like, that's good for them. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen like a dispute between like teachers and students or it's like gotten to that level. But Mm -hmm. I think it's more so like, like I think social media like plays like a big thing now. Mm. And like, like maybe different like pages pop up. Like they'll say, oh, we're exposing like racist, like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think like, People, like some people, like I don't really think like they can call themselves like real allies because they're not really like willing to sever connections and like relationships with people. And Mm -hmm. you can really see that when like those type of pages come out. But I think for like, like, I don't know, I think it kind of just like makes you like look at people differently now because, you know, we're not in person, but everything is just online. And like Mm -hmm. you can really see the type of people people are through their social media. Mm. Um, well, during when the George Floyd stuff happened, there was, um, like we, at first they tried to push it off. Like we really didn't talk about it at school. Uh Um, but then it was like, um, they would have the teachers try to tell us about it. And most of the teachers are, um, of are white. So when Mm -hmm. they would try to tell us, it would kind of be awkward because it's like, like we also like, he was killed wrongfully and that this officer deserves to go in jail. And sometimes you wouldn't get the same thing from the teacher or the teacher would be trying to explain it, but pick and choose their words in a very specific way. They choose sometimes when talking about um, racism and it, and it was weird because only we would only talk about um, police brutality or anything of this sort when something big happened or it was in the news. And they would try to tell us like, um, yeah, it was wrong, but not all police are bad. Like, throw in little things behind what they were saying. So it was more so like, oh, yeah, I'm on you guys' side, but at the same time, I feel like the other side might be right. So it was kind of, it was it was weird then, too, because 
as black students, you're looking at your teacher. And mm -hmm. if you are to say or challenge anything that they're saying, you know that there's um, a chance that you could be made to leave the classroom and then you're mm -hmm. missing school time, class time or anything. All type of stuff could happen just for saying that your teacher is wrong because of what they what they feel or what they believe and have brought to school. Right. right. We'll have more of these interviews right after this. Welcome back to Pick Up The Mic Podcast with your host, Corey Whitmore. This is episode four of uh, The Black Experience. We are talking about what it's like to be a student in the in the Trump, George Floyd, BLM era. Um, what impact has that had? Has it changed anything uh, in your classroom, in your school, with all these things going on outside of the school? So we're going to jump right back into some more interviews uh, from the MMSD students. When this whole like George Floyd, like Black Lives Matter, like thing, like absolutely exploded, mm -hmm. is a bunch of students at, I'm not gonna say specifically who they were, but start they started getting like exposed on social media for like saying like the N word in the past or like past like racial slurs and stuff like right, that. Right. And it was like, they were coming out left and right. Like every five right. minutes, there was like someone new posted on someone's story. Like, Oh, look at so-and-so look what they've done. And then like, I feel like everyone at said was like, this is the community I was in. Right. Like this re is really how y'all were rolling like the whole time. <laughs> And some of them were old, but it's still like shocking to go through all that. Right. Like within like 24 hours. And then people were like, all right, well, we're going to like the allies and stuff. We're like, all right, we're going to hack down, going to email their colleges that they're going to next year. Like it was like serious. Like people were mad. Definitely. Um, I think not only strange, but I think it's it just makes the whole experience a little bit like it shifts the view and like how you feel about it mm -hmm. because at least for me initially um i was fairly upset with like you know this like anti-racist like decision and you know things with like how the school is committed to being anti-racist and making sure that they're paying attention to you know the events that are happening like in the news whether it be jared chauvin or you know police brutality and things of that nature mm -hmm. But I, um, I definitely saw it as convenient and I don't know if I saw it as, you know, as much about, you know, being progressive and trying mm. to, you know, make sure that the black students voices are being heard because I think there's a difference between doing something because it matters and because you know that like, you know, it matters to you and it's important to you, but you know, it affects other people. And then there's doing things because it's relevant and because it's in the media and because people care about it now. Um. Uh, you know, you're either here or there. There's no mm. in between. Right. So, it, it, I don't, to go back to your question, I think it has made, like, classroom discussions more dis divisive. And, you know, some people are afraid to speak, speak up because some people might disagree with what they say. And mm. now with, like, uh cancel culture has become like rele very relevant right you know, few months as well so so you've heard from some of the students and what they've had to endure um in this uh trump blm george floyd era um as students and how <laughs> you know it it seems like it's a a tricky playing field when you have things coming out on social media about uh, kids or students that you interact with and you know their use of the n-word or you know their stance on some things that are going on in the world um, and then you're you're also looking at some of your teachers and, and seeing if they are truly in support with the things that that you believe to be right or wrong and if how if their ideals kind of support that or go against that so that's an interesting space to be in. What I want to do is is now take it from uh, a teacher's and administrative point of view, not necessarily on the experience, but has has this 
things that have happened in this Trump BLM George Floyd era has it changed things academically or education wise has have you been able to reroute I guess uh, some of the um, uh, resources towards black students has how the engagement with black students has that kind of come under fire or come under scrutiny and is the district possibly heading in the right direction as far as creating more things for mental health or or uh, reevaluating curriculum or um, as the other article said to create spaces for students to work through uh, this trauma so let's hear from uh, Mr. Shackelford and uh, and Dr. Rennie Briggs. After the events of this summer, I really I even see a little difference in a lot of the staff being more intentional on just like their part in a, in a lot of, you know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. like those microaggressions. What have I done right. to contribute to this? So, right. you know, it's baby steps, but I see we, we're making some progress. Right. I've right. seen I've seen more progress than I've seen since I started working in the district. So. Oh, wow. Wow. And it's still, it's still minute, but I said, <laughs> because I'll tell you, it used to be a lot of side eye and, oh, here we go again. And it, that's how, that's how kind of when you, anytime you did professional development centered around race, because yeah. then that was before like the term white fragility and white privilege came out. Mm-hmm. So people were just hiding behind it. Oh, I'm colorblind. When you say that, that means you refuse to acknowledge me and my culture you know, as me, I'm an individual and I have my own. It's not like you. So that's what you hear me say in class. I don't play that colorblind mess. I see color in this class. We applaud color. We celebrate. Yeah. We celebrate it. You know, there ain't no color blindness. But you see, that's what I'm saying. You had those sentiments. But now people are really kind of checking themselves and checking each other a little bit more because that's what it's going to take. Mm-hmm. Us black teachers and educators and people, we can't keep teaching white people about how not to be racist. Y'all got to start, you know, you got to get on board and start fixing it yourself. When you go into that room and you know it ain't no other people around and your your buddies and people start talking crazy, you got to check that. That's where this stuff starts, you know what I mean? And that's like I said, that's where we got to do. That's why I said it's better than it's been. We got a long way to go, but at least we got some progress going, uh, you know. Race has always been one to slow people down because people don't know how to respond to it. People mm-hmm. are afraid to say the wrong thing, right? And and rightfully so. You know, there's some people who have said something that's just plain right crazy right. Uh, and it's cost them their jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some cases, it may have cost people their lives. Right. Um, and when I think back to the the George Floyd protests and the Black uh, Lives Matter movement and all of these things, it goes back to something I said to you earlier. Racism is a crisis too, mm-hmm. right? And for many years, we've just dealt with racism. Dr. King said, protesting and violence is the voice of the unheard. Right. Right. And when you think about the, this movement towards equity and you think about, are we stuck in the mud? We get stuck in the mud three, four weeks after something impacts society racially. Mm. Meaning we protest for three, four, maybe five weeks. Mm -hmm. And then it's back to life as usual, right? Because if it was truly about protesting with longevity, guess what we will be still doing based on George Floyd? Guess what we will be doing still based on Sandra Bland? Guess what we will still be doing based on, you know, uh, Trayvon Martin, Mm -hmm. right? But those things only happen for a short window of time. Mm-hmm. And then it's like people say, you know what? I got to get back to my life. Right. But there's also other ways that we can protest. We can protest through education, meaning we have to educate 
these kids, man. We have to educate these adults who are working with kids because equity isn't just about, um, you know, people getting what they need. Equity is also about giving up things for the greater good. Mm. Right? right. Once again, going back to what Dr. Armonte Jackson said, people don't fear change. They fear loss. Right. And the moment that you feel like you have to give up something mm. for somebody else and you feel like you can't have what you always had, it feels bad. It feels like, dang, right? So we're stuck in the mud three to four or five weeks after something really bad happens in our country, as opposed to looking at the longevity of how we want it to play out. Thank you for that, Dr. Rennie Briggs and Mr. Shackelford. Those were insightful um, uh, perspectives, uh, kind of looking at things on, on a in-school level about some of the incremental changes that have at least started to occur and and we'll see if if those changes continue to grow and are permanent um but also kind of a wider point of view from uh dr rainy briggs as far as overall movement and really trying to to look at equity and seeing how close are we really getting to it um so i thank the both of them for for sharing that in those point of views we're going to uh, make sure we get in our teacher shout out and we are going to wrap things up right after this. You are tuned in to pick up the mic podcast with your host, Corey Whitmore. This is episode four. We appreciate everybody tuning in. You know, we're going to try and wrap things up talking about you know the the black experience what you know what has it been like for for students to to go to school and what's that environment been like with uh donald trump as president for for part of that time uh with the blm movement uh with the george floyd protests we've kind of just looked at what that experience has been like for the kids and try to analyze what are the effects what are the short-term long-term effects of all these things that are going on around them. I do want to reference uh, one more thing for you guys before uh, we wrap things up. I tripped over uh, a very interesting report research that was done uh, at UCLA's Institute for Democracy, Education and Access. Um, this was kind of a report that was put together um, in 2017 and it's titled Teaching and Learning in the Age of Trump, Increasing Stress and Hostility in America's High Schools. So, you know, it's a great document. It's, 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 a, it's a great paper. They, they analyze a number of uh, different things, you know, from increase of, of stress, um, the polarization in schools, the uh, looking at hostile environments for racial and religious minorities, um, it, it was very thorough. There's a few things that really stuck out to me and I think will add some, some framing to this conversation. Uh, when they looked at, uh, they titled it a growing number of schools, particularly predominantly white schools, became hostile environments for racial and religious minorities and other vulnerable groups. Um, here were some bullet points, uh, some things that they, find, they found out um, through the research. They said 27.7% of teachers reported an increase in students making derogatory remarks about other groups during class discussions. Um, it goes on to say that many teachers described how the political environment unleashed racist, uh, anti-Islamic, anti-Semitic, or homophobic rhetoric in their schools and classrooms. Um, an Indiana English teacher explained Individuals who do harbor perspectives and racism and bigotry now feel empowered to offer their views more naturally in class discussions, which has led to tension and even conflict in the classroom. Um, it goes on to say that acts of intimidation and hostility took their toll on young people and undermined student learning. Students who were victims of verbal assaults withdrew from class discussions and sometimes missed class altogether. Hmm. 
So I'd encourage you know, anybody who, who's interested in and it has some incredible facts. It has quotes from teachers all around the country um, to look up teaching and learning in the age of Trump, increasing stress and hostility in America's high school. I believe this research really only supports what we've heard from the kids and, and what we've been discussing uh, during this episode. Their learning environment has changed um, because of everything that, you know, that has happened of late. Um, you know, the rhetoric in the, in the political arena, um, the protests and different things going on. It has led to more conflicts, as, as some of the students will say, you know, <laughs> they were uh, exposing people on social media. You know, they, every time they look up, they would pop up. It'd be a screenshot of somebody making some derogatory remark. I can only imagine how that kind of degrades that that learning environment, creeps into that motivation of, you know, do I really want to be here? Do I even really want to show up? Do I want to be a part of this class? You know, they, they're not doing anything to these students. Do I want to be a part of this school that has these type of students and these type of people here? And a fallout from that is much like the, the research paper said, you know, some students may not show up. If you're not if you're not showing up or, you know, you're missing lessons that you're you're missing part of that learning experience, part of that curriculum. Does that start to show itself on tests like the forward exam? Does it start to show itself on um, the ACTs, SATs? Does it start to show itself on more standardized testing, uh, which we talked about in episode two? The impact is going to be hard to measure right now, but I believe um, going forward, uh, we will see the fallout from a hostile environment that many of these students uh, found themselves in, unfortunately. So that is all that we have for episode four. As we do at the end of every episode, we want to make sure that we give um, coach, teacher, counselor, administrator um, a shout out. So here we go with uh, episode four, another student shout out. Of course, first of all, Molly. Molly is awesome. Like she's <laughs> been here since I wasn't even a freshman. Like she was there when I had summer school at La Follette and she's just been awesome ever since then. And she just been supporting me ever since then. So definitely Molly um, and definitely Miss Randall. She's a reading teacher and definitely Mr. Milton. He is the pinnacle for black students at La Folly. So those are the three I have. Shout out Miss Hayes, Miss Randall and Mr. Milton uh, for everything that you've done. Um, man, we, we cannot thank you enough for the work uh, that you put in over at La Follette. Um, and, and we are we are incredibly grateful and appreciative of everything uh, that you guys have and are continuing to give these students. So thank you. All right. This is episode four. We appreciate everybody tuning in and listening. Thank you to the students once again. Thank you to our community leaders. Make sure to, to check us out on social media at Pick Up The Mic Podcast. We are on Instagram and Facebook. We try and, and share excerpts from uh, from the episodes, um, try to share some of the uh, publications and things that we reference in there as well. So uh, make sure to, to add us and follow us on there. And next week, we will be getting into the importance of black teachers. Um, that will be our next topic in episode five. So I can't wait for that. We appreciate everybody. Thank you again for your time. This is Pick Up the Mic Podcast, and we'll see you next week.